<clears throat> Beginning in Proverbs chapter 4, let me start by reading the first 13 verses there. Proverbs chapter 4, and in verse 1. Hear, ye children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also, and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace. A crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. And when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. The idea that I'm dealing with today is simply here. Here. And right in the beginning of this proverb, and you'll find it over and over and over again throughout, the idea of hear, hearken, listen, attend. God wants us to hear his word. He wants us to hear from him. When he speaks, it's not just so he fills dead air. God speaks so that his people would receive it. A gift is only a gift if you actually take it. A, a spoken voice is only heard or, or does what it's intended to if it's heard and received. If you look at verse 1 there in Proverbs chapter 4, it talks about the instruction of a father. Hear, ye children, the instruction of a father. This is, I believe, Solomon addressing his boy as he comes up after him. Verse or Chapter 2 and chapter 3 both start with, My son, my son. And so Solomon is trying to reach his son. He's trying to instruct his son. He's trying to guide his son after him. Solomon prayed very early in his life when he was first appointed to be king that he would have wisdom to lead his people for he was just a child and didn't think he could do so. And God provided because of the humble spirit that he prayed unto him that Solomon would be the wisest man of all. He said also to him as a bonus, you know, because you didn't ask for riches and wealth, I'll give that to you as well. So Solomon then was the wisest and he was the richest of all men. And of course, that didn't lead to a righteous lifestyle. Money can't save you from doing wickedly. Solomon had no worries, and yet he learned much because of the wisdom of his heart. He grew in grace. He, he understood scriptures. He penned scriptures. And he wants to present this to his boys after when he says, Here, attend unto no understanding. He says in the second half of that verse 1. Attend to no understanding. He says, here, be here, be present. Attend to know what understanding is and what it even means. Verse 2 says, for I give you good doctrine, forget ye not my law. How do we receive good doctrine, good teaching? We receive it from the law. And that's why we're going through Deuteronomy and sometimes it might feel a little bit like it's Snoresville. Sometimes when I open Deuteronomy, I find it challenging to read it because you don't understand how this is going to really practically apply to you until you really attend to these truths, hear these truths. And suddenly the law takes on a life of its own and gives you understanding, gives you good doctrine. But these things aren't always easy to dig up. Sometimes it takes a little bit of work, a little bit of patience, a little bit of prayer, a little bit of attention. And this is why Solomon, the voice of God coming through him, says, Hear, ye children, Attend to no understanding. I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law. I love how Solomon says in his writing, Forsake ye not my law. I believe Solomon had taken the law of God and applied it to himself. This is my law now. This is what I follow. 
It ought, it ought to be for all of us. The law that we follow, my law, is the law of God. And when we align what, what I want to do and what my law is and what my standard is with God's, you're, you're taking a great step to actually fulfilling what God expects for you in your life. He says here, the law of the Lord is my own law. Son, attend to these things. He wants us to study then Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus. He wants us to absorb all of these scriptures, the law, and in them we'll find good doctrine. In them we will know understanding as a result. These are words that we ought to live by. Verse 3 continues on and says, For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved, in the sight of my mother. He taught me also, and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. These are indeed words to live by, and they went from the father to David as Solomon's father, and now Solomon wants to give it unto his children. That generations after would know, seek, believe, attend unto the law of God. If they would do so, they would live. Keep my commandment and live is the promise here that God makes. We can continue on down. It says, get wisdom and get understanding. Forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not and she shall preserve thee. Love her and she shall keep thee. Here wisdom is being personified as a woman. Don't forsake her. She shall preserve thee. Love her and she shall keep thee. It's like a father's instruction. And here wisdom is like the mother's tenderness and love. They come together in leading the child onto that right path. Verse 7, it says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. The primary, the first, the principal thing is wisdom. The most important thing we can grasp in this life. I bet you Solomon is thankful that that was the first thing he asked of God when the Lord said, What will I give thee? He said, Give me wisdom, that understanding art, that I can lead these people. It's the principal thing, and Solomon set off early in his days to get that. Exalt her, verse 8, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory. She shall deliver to thee. Hear, O my son, and receive of my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in the right path. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened, and when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Wisdom, get a hold of it. It's a principal thing. Get a hold of her and do not let go. This is where your life resides, especially as a believer, especially as a follower of the Almighty God. Continuing on down in verse 20, it says, My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Here I believe Solomon's promising that you'll even have health to your flesh if you just keep the words of life. So instead of hiding away from these things when you're worried about your health, you ought to get in them more and more and more. Attend to the words. Incline thine ear. Hear the sayings of God. They are life to those that find them. That means you have to look for them if you want to find them. You have to diligently seek them if you're going to get a hold of them. And if you do, there's your life. If you do, there is health to your flesh. Don't even let them depart from your eyes. Have them before thee. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Remember these things. Commit them to thy heart. You can see then here the desire of a father. That he wants his son to hear the truth, to know the truth, to live by the truth, and receive life as a result. And I believe God, through the inspiration that he put upon Solomon, is even reaching out to every one of us today and saying, Hear the words of a father. I want you to know these things, son. I want you to know these things, daughter. Wisdom is the principal thing. And, and we can read these, though Solomon, in his mind, was penning them to his son. And so continue on in chapter 5. God, through Solomon, was sending them to each and every one of us. Chapter 5, then, in verse 1, it says, My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. 
Here we have the three principal things you'll find in the book of Proverbs. I've highlighted them in blue every time I saw them. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, all going together. And they all, from a quick view, may seem like they're pretty much the same thing, but there's subtle differences to what they actually mean, especially in the context of scriptures. Do you know what knowledge is? Knowledge is just facts. That's just facts about X, Y, and Z. One plus one equals two. That is knowledge. You know that, but until you know knowledge that X, Y, Z, or that one plus one equals two, you're going to have a hard time with the next step, which is wisdom. Wisdom takes one plus one equals two and actually gives a purpose to it. I have to get two items. So I'm going to get one and one, and now that I now I have two, okay? Knowledge is simply the fact. Wisdom is then the purpose of that fact. And you know what understanding is? Taking those two items that you now got by knowledge and understanding and using them for the appropriate use. Applying them is what understanding is. Knowledge is all of the items that you need. Wisdom gives them their purpose, and understanding actually carries it out and applies it in the end. But all three of these together founded in the fear of the Lord, and each one is given, I believe, that, that, uh, that saying, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, of understanding. The fear of the Lord is the foundation. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge will lead you, whether you're young or whether you're old, in the way of righteousness. It says here that if you walk in that way of righteousness, the promise is that your path will not be straightened. When you runnest, thou shalt not stumble if you're in the way of righteousness. How do you get there? Fear God above all things. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Get knowledge and use these in your life and you shall be considered what the book of Proverbs calls the wise. The wise have knowledge. The wise have wisdom, of course. The wise have understanding. And God always is contrasting the wise here in this teaching with the wicked, with the evil, with the the unlearned, essentially, in these truths. How do you end up wise and not a fool? Hear the instruction of the Father. It's simple as that. The fool rejects these things. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But if you attend unto these things, if you hear these truths, if you hearken unto these truths and apply these truths in your life, you will be considered of the wise and understanding and not be a fool. Where do we get this? Well, if you go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, one book to the right, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, I would say, though we talked about it earlier, Yeah, you can get the words of God into your life, into your mind, into your heart, in your own gates, and in your own place. You should do that. You ought to do that. But the best place to really grow in the things of God and to really hear the voice of God, I believe Solomon brings up in his addendum to Proverbs, you know, the end of his life, after accumulating all these Proverbs and penning many of them down, and then his scribes went and took, by the inspiration of God, I believe, the best of them and laid them forth in these, this final book of Proverbs that we now hold today. At the end of Solomon's life, he reflected on it all in the book of Ecclesiastes, which is obviously, and, and honestly, quite a depressing book at times because he's always just talking about how vain life was because he knew all of these things and yet did them not quite often. And when he grew in this area, he realized that ultimately he knew nothing at all. And in the end of it all, he said, this is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. And this is how you can live a life that is not vain, that is not empty, that is not pointless, is to fear God above all things and keep his commandments. So again, Proverbs, he's teaching his children and children's children about how to be the wise, how, how to be instructed, how to be not a fool and avoid being a fool. And now here in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 1, look what it says. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools for they consider not that they do evil. Where do we get wisdom? Where do we get understanding? Where do we get knowledge in the house of God? In our 
They, the church of God, the pillar and the ground of the truth, ought to be the foundation in your life to where you hear the word of God in his house. And here God says through Solomon, hey, when you go to the house of God, be more ready to hear than to give sacrifice. Okay, be more ready to hear what the word of God has for you than to just perform some sort of sacrificial ritual. Be more ready to hear what God is trying to say to you than to give your tithe, than to give your offering, than to give your service, than to give your efforts. All of these things essentially couple with the idea of works, and yet hearing transcends that. There's no work to hearing. Jesus said it this way when he was talking to Mary and Martha. You remember the story in the New Testament. Jesus went to their house and sat down and Martha was busy, cumbered much with much things, preparing, uh, giving sacrifice to God, serving him, doing things for him, making him dinner. She was just busy, 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 busy running around. And she looked at her sister who was sitting at the feet of Jesus and she said, Lord, won't you make her do something? Bid her to help me in this. And Jesus said, she hath that good part and that won't be removed from her. And what was she doing? Sitting at the feet of Jesus and hearing him. And when we come to the house of God, we ought to be more ready to be Mary than to be Martha. Be more ready to sit at Jesus' feet and hear than to just get busy in things and activities and what have you. We see how important it is to be ready to hear the word of God with that healthy fear. Look at verse 2 there in chapter 5. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of busyness, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. In other words, just sit down and hear God. There's nothing wrong with that. Be ready to hear. He's in heaven. Let thy words be few. Don't utter anything before him. It's just giving us that, that clear depiction that when we're in the house of God, it ought to be a time of hearing and less talking. When we're talking, we're not hearing, and we know this. And some of us, when we're talking, even when we're not talking, we should be hearing. We stop hearing because we're thinking about the next thing we're going to say. And we all often get into that trap, too, when we're talking with someone back and forth. When we're talking to God, look, I always want to just talk, 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 talk when I'm praying. Okay, God, here's what I want, and this is what I need, and this is what you want to do, and this is what you got to do, and this is what and is going wrong in my life, and this is what I... And God's like... Uh, and then you stop and you say, amen. And he's like, my son. And I'm like, already going away. <laughs> Isn't that the danger we get into? We just lit, sit down, we pray to God, lay out all of our problems, and he's about to talk to us. We're already done. Prayer time's over, right? I already told God all my problems, right? Just a little, have a little chat with Jesus, right? And he didn't even get a word in. Sometimes just think about how you treat your Lord. I mean, I, we can joke about that all the same, but... God wants to talk to you. He said of Mary, she hath that good part. That won't be taken from her. You're doing all these things. You have all these things going on. You've got activities abound. But hey, just come and hear me. That's what God wants. And that's why he set this whole book, Proverbs, through a father to just say, my son, hear me. My son, hear my instruction. My son, attend to these things. My son, hearken. My son, listen to me. And in Ecclesiastes, later Solomon says, you know what, a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. I think Solomon had, a, had the same problem I have. He just talked too much. Didn't listen enough. And I think we all have that problem if we think about it. We talk too much to God and don't listen enough to Him. We may read His Word, but are we really listening to what God is saying to us in those moments that we're taking His Word in? I think today it's a, it's a problem everywhere. There's too much talking and not enough hearing. Now, when it comes to hearing the Word of God, you can go to Acts chapter 17 in the New Testament. When it comes to hearing the Word of God, we also got to be mindful of these things as well. <clears throat> God says to be more ready to hear than to utter anything before Him. In Acts chapter 17, we find the story of the Bereans. They're often referred to, but often I find that 
this little portion of scripture is misrepresented, or rather, a, a big part of it is just kind of overlooked. Look with me, Acts chapter 17, and in verse 10. I've done the same thing, and that's why I know that quite often people miss it, because I did the same thing. Verse 10, it says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went unto the synagogue of the Jews. So here's the situation. There's a great troublous uproar in Thessalonica. The brethren gather up Paul and Silas and sneak them out by night, and they enter into... Berea. They probably should have, you know, avoided getting into more trouble, but nevertheless, the first thing that they wanted to do was to just charge into the synagogue. The enemy's front lines, and they're going to go and to preach to these people. Now look at the testimony of the Bereans. Verse 11 says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Okay, the testimony here is twofold. And what usually happens is we grab hold of that second one. I don't know why, maybe it just sounds better. It's, it's got that, that alliteration to it, search the scriptures daily. to find. I don't know what makes us grab a hold of that but miss the first part. We're all really good at searching the scriptures to find out whether those things were so. When we come to the house of God and we're hearkening unto the word of God, we're going to search the scriptures just to find out whether those things are so. We're going to check out everything the preacher says, and you should check out everything the preacher says. We're going to make sure that what that person said was spot on with the scriptures, and you should make sure that what you're hearing lines up with the scriptures. So search the scriptures daily to find out whether those things are so. But what do we miss often is that first part, received the word with a readiness of mind. Hearing, hearkening, ready to hear, more ready to hear than to speak, than to utter anything before God. We often miss out on the part of receiving the word with a readiness of mind. We become critics, and any one of us, we can look around the room, and I know people that have went to churches that weren't the best, and churches that weren't ideal, and churches that had differences of opinions than what you had. So we've all been in scenarios where we went in and we heard something that didn't line up with what we believe the Bible taught. We searched the scriptures to find out whether those things were so, and then we exposed them as a heretic. <laughs> Maybe not to that extreme every time, but you know what I'm saying. We're really good at finding fault in what's being said finding fault into the, in the word that's coming across. Because we're not grabbing hold of really the nobility of the Thessalonians was that they coupled these things. And when they couple these two items, what happens? Verse 12, Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women which were Greeks, and of men not a few. So many, not just a few, believed as a result of coupling, I believe, the reception of the word with a readiness of mind with searching the scriptures daily to find out whether those things were so. That says that when Paul and Silas, who were strangers, walked into the synagogue and they started preaching, the people were ready to hear. They were attending to the things which were preached. They were listening in and hearkening unto these things. And you know what? I think that also indicates that they had a pen with them because they were writing them down. Or they just had really good memories. But me personally, I have to travel with a little book everywhere I go because if I don't write things down, I will remember them. But regardless, they heard, received the word with a readiness of mind, and then it says in search of scriptures daily to find out whether those things were so. That probably happened after the fact. That probably happened after they went home. Or maybe at this time, a lot of them didn't even have Bibles on their laps to look over. Ever thought about that? I think sometimes there would be a big scroll that was at the front. Remember, Jesus was brought the scroll when he, scroll when he taught in the synagogue. There was a scroll for the whole village. He opened it, he read it, he closed it, he preached. He said, this day these scriptures are fulfilled in your ears, and it caused an uproar. But regardless, perhaps the same thing happened. Scriptures were open, the Apostle Paul preached, and everyone received it with a readiness of mind. And it says, search the scriptures daily. It doesn't say search the scriptures instantaneously at the moment. As it was going on, they were like, oh, well, I don't know. That's, he didn't uh, pronounce it thee, thou, oh, I, you know, at the same time. No, I believe that it probably happened after that. It probably happened when they went home. And when we miss that first part, receiving the word with the readiness of mind, I mean, that's the failure. 
That's the failure point, in my opinion. Whenever I've been under preaching, whether we'd call it good preaching, bad preaching, mediocre preaching, loud preaching, soft preaching, I've been under some strange preaching in my days. But every time, every time, in the best of my ability, I tried to apply the first portion of that scriptures to, to the moment that I was in. Receiving the word with a readiness of mind and then searching the scriptures daily to find out whether those things were so. What I found when I do that is that quite often, yeah, you may have somebody that is preaching something. Mm, I'm not sure I agree with that. But they're going to say something that your ready mind will grab a hold of and you'll say, whoa, I think God's telling me something through that. I think I can hear the word of God in that. Even though this is like a Presbyterian pastor and I'm only here because I'm at a wedding, I think he said something. I think God just said something through that man. I think I'm hearing the word of God. I receive that with a readiness of mine and later it affirms in my Bible study that, yep, God spoke to me through that Presbyterian dress wearing weirdo. Okay. Now I'm not, of course, advocating that you spend all of your weekends in a Presbyterian dress wearing church, right? But you find yourself in scenarios sometimes that aren't ideal. The preaching isn't the best. The preaching is... If you're ready to receive the word, look at what happened to these Jews. Somebody came in that was a born-again Christian, completely different than what they would ever believe, and yet they received what he was preaching with a readiness of mind. And as a result, God spoke to them in so much that not a few, many of these dress-wearing Jews believed on Christ that day. Why? Because they were noble enough to say, this is a man of God, okay? I don't know much about him. I've never heard him speak before. Let's see what the Apostle Paul has to say. You know what? The Apostle Paul, if you read the scriptures, many accused him of having contemptible speech. So I don't think he was a great orator. I don't think he was a great speaker, but he had the power of God on him. And so when he came up and maybe stumbled and bumbled, or maybe he he kind of read into his scriptures like this, and he wasn't very excitable, and, and he didn't pound the pulpit, and he just... Whatever it was that made his speech contemptible, it made no effect. It didn't matter at all for that the word of God was coming through him. God was speaking through the words that the Apostle Paul was there. And if you're not ready to receive the word with the readiness of mind, you're going to miss out on something. And search the scriptures daily to find out whether those things were so. Those two things coming together, hearing what God's saying, and then checking it out in your own Bible study, in your own reading, amazing, amazing coupled together, you'll find great growth in your life. And if you don't couple these together, if you're not receiving the word, if you're not searching the word, it's no wonder that sometimes we have issues in our lives. You know the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You want to grow in faith, you got to hear God speak first. Of course, the words of God are spoken unto you. But also the preaching of the word of God helps you out as well. Go to Proverbs chapter 8. We'll finish up there. In Proverbs chapter 8, God speaks so that men would listen. I don't know if that old adage applies, but if the word of God goes forward and there's no one to hear, was it ever spoken? I don't know. It's one of those things, falls on deaf ears. Did, did it ever prove it? Did it ever do what it was intended to do? I know God's word never returns void. It does exactly what he intended it to do. But here we have wisdom again, personified as a lady, crying out. So Christians today, be more ready to hear than to speak. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 1 says, Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding Put forth her voice. She's trying to be heard. So she cries out. Verse 2, She standeth in the top of the high places, by the way, in the places of the paths. She crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in, at the doors. Unto you, O men, I call. And my voice is to the sons of men. O oh, ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. Your wisdom is trying to get your attention. 
She's crying out at the right at the highway. The way is going by. She's in the high places, in the places of that path. She's trying to draw men unto that path, crying in the gates, crying in the entry of the city, crying at the coming in of the doors, and she's saying, Men, I'm calling unto you. Men, I want you to hear me. My voice is to the sons of men. And look, she wants to change men for the better. Oh, ye simple, won't stay that way. Understand wisdom. Ye fools, don't linger like that. Be ye of an understanding heart. Hear, for I will speak excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. Verse 9, They are all plain to him that understandeth, and right unto them that find knowledge. So the more you understand, the more plain God's word will be unto you. You won't be confused, you won't be confounded by it. The more that you get after knowledge, the more it will appear right unto you. You get the facts about God's words straight. You start to understand and apply these things. This simple verse is saying, and the knowledge that you get and the understanding that you apply will make it so that God's word as a whole will be plain and right to you at all times. But it had to start somewhere, and it started with hearing it. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by this word of God. And so wisdom continues to cry out and to draw men unto herself so that they would grow, they would change, they would, they would be strengthened by the word of God. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 32, it says, Now, therefore, hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoso findeth me findeth life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. They that hate me love death. Wisdom again, reaching out to children and saying, Hey, time to grow up. Keep my ways, you'll be blessed. Hear instruction and be wise. Refuse it not. So once you've heard it, hey, time to be wise and apply it. Do something with that truth that you've just heard. Blessed is the man that heareth, watching daily at my gates. You know what that means? Is when Even when wisdom has gone and taken a rest, you're waiting at her door saying, I need more wisdom. You're waiting at the gates for as soon as they come open. I need more wisdom. You want understanding. You want to grow by the words of God as they come forth unto you. Blessed is the man that heareth, watches daily at the door, waiting at the post on the door. It says this, Whoso findeth me, findeth life. If you're going to find something, you have to seek something. You have to go looking for wisdom. And wisdom is here in the Word of God. God's waiting to speak to you through His Word. In the preaching, God's waiting to speak to you through His Word in the reading of it. But if you don't go looking for it, you'll never find it you got to find wisdom. How do you find wisdom? Go looking for it. And when you do, you will obtain favor of the Lord. And that's the greatest of favor you could have. You don't need to have favor of the world. You don't need to have favor of your bosses. You don't need to have favor of the guy that works at the corner store. You don't even need to have favor among your peers here if you have the favor of the Lord. How do you get that? Find wisdom. Find understanding. Find the life that is in these things. Look what God says of his own law. Listen for me in Proverbs 19. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. God's favor comes through hearing his word understanding his word, applying his word, knowing his word. You only get that, though, if you start by hearing his word. Open your ears. Bow down thine ear, God often says. When you're bowing, how do you bow down your ear to a God speaking to you above? It's because you got on your knees, right? You bow down your ear and you're like, God, speak for thy servant heareth. I think sometimes we just talk too much to God. Sometimes God just wants us to listen. 
I did that for a while. I think I need to get back into that season. You kind of just set a time in your prayer time to just say that. Speak for thy servant here. I'm not talking about some weirdo contemplative meditation or anything like that. Have the word of God before you. But just spend some time not talking about all of the things that you need God to do for you and say, God, speak to me. I'm listening. I want to hear what you want me to do. Kind of turn things around a bit and watch God do wonders. We need to be more like those Bereans that receive the word with a readiness of mind and search the scriptures to find out whether those things were so. If God tells you something in darkness, bring it to light by saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not so sure about that. I think God is impressing on me to do such and such, this and that, X, Y, and Z. Let me go find out what God wants me to do. And God will do that. He will impress on your heart to go and do this or do that or whatsoever. And a lot of people want to say, yeah, God told me to do this. But you say, okay, well, where is that in the word? Well, I don't know. That's your own heart. It's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. But if God tells you something... He's got a Bible verse to back it up. Hear what he says. Search the scriptures to find out whether those things were so. Be more ready to hear than to, than to speak. God will do great things for you. Wisdom's crying. Who's